order. The committee, uh, without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any time. As a reminder, members participating in a hearing remotely should be visible on camera throughout the hearing. For members participating in person, masks are optional. As with in-person meetings, members are responsible for controlling their own microphone, and you can be muted by staff only to uh, avoid inadvertent background noise. And as a reminder, statements, documents, or motions must be submitted to the electronic repository to sccc.repository at mail.house.gov. Finally, uh, if anyone's experiencing technical difficulties, please alert the staff right away. Uh, and welcome to the Cost Saving Climate Solutions, Investing in Energy Efficiency to Promote Energy Security and Cut uh, Energy Bills uh, Committee Meeting. Uh, today we will explore how investments in energy efficiency can save Americans money, reduce carbon emissions, and promote energy security. I'll now recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. Well, on Monday, the world's top scientist, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, issued another stark wake-up call. We're behind, we're late, and we're running out of time to limit warming and avoid catastrophic impacts and rising costs. And unless we dramatically ramp up our efforts to expand clean energy and reduce heat trapping pollution, the consequences will be bleak. But America has the clean technologies needed to avoid these costly impacts. But unless Congress deploys them with urgency in partnership with innovators and entrepreneurs and across the economy, Americans will be forced to pay more and more the economic case for cost-saving clean energy and energy efficiency innovations is clear. In fact, the very first recommendation in our committee's climate crisis action plan is maximizing energy efficiency, one of the most cost-effective solutions for nearly all sectors of the economy. By making our transmission lines more efficient, uh, we can expand the reach of affordable renewables. By making renewables more fuel efficient, and deploying electric cars and trucks and fleets, we can save Americans money at the pump and avoid the volatility of global oil and gas markets. And by investing in energy efficiency and electrification upgrades, we can drive down the cost of keeping the lights on, keeping appliances running, and keeping the temperature agreeable inside and out. Here's one example of how electrification can dramatically improve efficiency. According to the Department of Energy, electric vehicles use more than 75% of the energy they get from the grid to get your wheels moving, whereas gas vehicles only use about 12 to 30% of the energy from gasoline. In other words, when you charge up your electric car, you'll use three quarters of that energy to get where you're going. But when you fill up your tank, you're using less than a quarter. So that's $40 that you paid at the pump. Just $10 of that gets you moving, and the rest is wasted. So beyond cost-saving potential, investing in cleaner, cheaper technologies will also go a long way in building the true American energy independence and security. Clean energy investments support American workers, American industries, and American manufacturers, instead of supporting foreign dictators and big oil CEOs. By maximizing these savings, we can reinvest them to strengthen our most vulnerable communities, and we can deploy transformative energy-efficient technologies that could potentially reduce heat, gap, heat trapping pollution by between 50 and 80 percent by the year 2050. Federal investment in energy efficiency will put money back into the pockets of Americans. The average household could save up to $500 a year with the investments in the House passed reconciliation bill going even further would save households even more. By electrifying everything, we could save families thousands of dollars every year and cut their energy use, use in half. Those extra savings would be a godsend for Americans, especially those least, uh, least able to afford their energy costs. So there's a common theme here. The cost of climate change and the cost of energy seem to always fall on working families, while oil and gas companies are reaping record profits. 
Americans are paying more at the pump for last century's fuels. Meanwhile, their communities are the ones suffering the economic harms of climate fuel disasters, which cost more than $145 billion last year. For too many Americans, it's hard not to feel like they're getting ripped off. That's why President Biden is working to lower energy costs and expand clean technologies. The Biden administration is working to update energy conservation standards for appliances and to modernize energy codes for federal buildings. They're also working to deploy the investments in the bipartisan infrastructure law, which included more than $3 billion to make homes more energy efficient and lower cost. Thanks to the infrastructure law, we are also poised to build a national network of 500,000 EV charging stations with the goal of making them as readily available as gas stations. So as we stare down the barrel of a costly climate catastrophe, there's so much more that we must do. And the world's top scientists did offer a hopeful note. Uh, in their report that reinforces the action we see across America. We have the talent, the innovations, the tools, and the technology to save consumers money, to reduce pollution, and provide a livable planet for future generations. So I look forward to the insight of our witnesses and our committee's discussion today. And at this time, I'm happy to recognize the ranking member, Mr. Graves. You're, good morning. You're recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Madam Chair. Thank you um, for having this hearing. And, and uh, this is another topic, uh, Madam Chair, where um, you and I, I think, share a lot of objectives. We've spent a lot of time talking about resiliency and adaptation of our respective coastal states and coastal districts. Um, and, and the importance of making investments there. Being from South Louisiana, we've uh, had 90% of the coastal wetlands lost in the continental United States, which does make our communities more vulnerable to, to hurricanes and sea rise and other, other challenges uh, related to sustainability. Um, this one, uh, energy efficiency. Look, if we, can, if we can reduce the consumption of energy and things that we're doing, and uh, whether it's in our business, it's driving vehicles, it's uh, uh, manufacturing, then that helps improve the competitiveness, competitiveness of the United States. Energy efficiency, energy conservation efforts are, are absolutely critical um, in, in our long-term objectives here. And, and, and it's a no regrets approach because it, it allows us to reduce the, the cost of utility bills for consumers that are struggling with the, um, their ability to, to pay those bills today. It, it helps to reduce the cost of, of fueling vehicles in order to uh, get to work or, uh, or, or, or uh, go to school or uh, spend time with family. Th those are all win-wins and those are no regrets. It improves the competitiveness of the United States. But Madam Chair, I think something that, that, that's really important to keep in mind as well is the international perspective here. Um, you're right, IPCC did release a new uh, report uh, last week and, and um, it's, it's interesting because what's happened with Ukraine has, has sort of made, I think a lot of people realize uh, the United States is, is one country in a, in, a, in a very large global community. And you have people that operate by different standards and we often find ourselves trying to apply American values, American ethics, American standards to other countries. How do you think Vladimir Putin feels about that? How do you think he feels about America's values, our standards? Look at what he's doing. He's, he's, he's completely just rolling over people. No respect for human rights, no respect for sovereignty. Yet he's going to be a partner in climate change? Not a chance in hell. What about, what about uh, President Xi in China? You, you think looking at what they're doing with slave labor and child labor, uh, the, the way that they completely abuse the, the Uyghurs and human rights. Do you, do you really think that China is going to uh, have any respect for human rights? China's released four tons of emissions, increased four tons of emissions for every one ton we've reduced. I, I think that we're looking at ourselves a, 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 a little bit more, um, as a bit more inflated than we really are. We're not going to be able to solve this issue on our own. Let me say it again. China has increased emissions four tons for every one ton of emissions we've reduced. That's moving in the wrong direction globally, yet we're sitting here talking about spending not millions, not hundreds of millions, not billions, tens of billions and hundreds of billions of dollars 
to try to save the planet whenever we've got other international actors that don't care. They don't care. Let me read you something. Energy, uh, uh, President Biden's energy plan is going to result in higher electricity prices, higher prices at the gas pump, lost revenue sharing for hurricane protection, flood control, and coastal restoration, higher delivery costs, meaning delivery of groceries and all products, more dependence on foreign energy from China, Russia, Iran, and other countries, and a net increase in global emissions. Madam Chair, all of those things, let me run through them again. Higher electricity prices, check, we're seeing it. Higher prices at the gas pump, check, we're seeing it. Lost revenue, because as a result of not doing lease sales, the first president in modern history to not do energy lease, lease sales, we're losing revenue. The United States Treasury is losing revenue, which means because we have revenue sharing for offshore energy production, my home state, one of the most powerful hurricanes to ever make landfall, Hurricane Ida, we're not getting the revenues that we should have to, to build hurricane protection and restoring our coastal ecosystem and other projects, flood control. So, so that one we've realized. Higher delivery cost uh, with inflation and supply chain, we're getting higher costs there. More dependence on foreign energy from China, Russia, and others, we, we're seeing that. Um, a net increase in global emissions, we've seen that. This is a statement that I made on January 27th of last year. Madam Chair, I am all for, I am all for the objectives that you've stated, but we have got to have a strategy that is actually global looking in nature and one that truly achieves the objectives, not one that just thrusts costs from the United States taxpayers and makes energy unaffordable and doesn't achieve what I believe are our common environmental goals. Yield back. Now I want to welcome our witnesses. We've got a great panel to talk about the benefits of energy efficiency. Uh, Paula R. R. Glover is the president of the Alliance to Save Energy. Ms. Glover leads a diverse coalition of stakeholders to find lasting, consensus-based energy efficiency solutions. She's helped the Alliance secure billions of dollars in federal funding for energy efficiency programs amplified its work on energy justice and worked to advance the next generation of technologies. Darnell Johnson is the CEO and president of the Urban Efficiency Group, Illinois' first minority-owned utility implementation contractor and sustainability design firm run by and for Chicagoans. His, his work with UEG has assisted thousands of underserved residents in Indiana, Illinois, and Wisconsin, helped them reduce their energy burden by delivering energy efficiency and clean energy to communities. Mr. Johnson is also the vice chair of the Building Performance Association and chair of its Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. Dave Shriver is the president and CEO of the American Public Gas Association. Ms. Shriver, Mr. Shriver leads APGA's work to represent the interests of America's publicly owned natural gas local distribution companies before Congress, federal agencies, and other energy-related stakeholders. And Sarah Baldwin is the Director of Electrification Policy at Energy Innovation. Ms. Baldwin leads the firm's electrification policy practice area, providing research and analysis on the pathways to electrify and decarbonize buildings, transportation, and industry. Without objection, the witnesses' written statements will be made part of the record. With that, Ms. Glover, you are now recognized for five minutes to summarize your testimony. Welcome. Thank you very much. Chair Castor, Ranking Member Graves, members of the House Select Committee. Ms. My Glover, will you pull the mic up a little closer? Make How sure. is that? That's a little better. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Chair Castor, Ranking Member Graves, members of the House Select Committee. My name is Paula Glover. I am the president of the Alliance to Save Energy, and I really appreciate you having me at today's hearing. The Alliance is a nonprofit. We are a bipartisan coalition of business, government, environmental, and consumer leaders working to expand the economy while using less energy, doing more and using less. We were founded in 1977 by Senator Charles H. Percy from Illinois and Senator Hubert Humphrey from Minnesota in response to the oil embargo and the energy crisis at that time. Today, in addition to a potential energy crisis resulting from the pandemic and the geopolitical crisis in Europe, we are also moving closer to a climate crisis, the climate tipping point. And this requires us to develop climate change solutions while also meeting the challenges of energy security and affordability. 
We are required to lead in energy production, but we must also lead in energy efficiency throughout all sectors of the U.S. economy, including manufacturing, transportation, and agriculture, and the built environment. And as we make these investments in efficiency products, equipment, supplies, and technologies, and as consumers and businesses adopt efficiency solutions, energy consumption is reduced and generation and production supplies are offset through lowered demand. In fact, without these investments made in efficiency since 1980, energy consumption would have been more than 60% higher. And these same investments help consumers avoid approximately $800 billion a year in energy costs. That is the power of efficiency. This is achieved by investments that secure the building envelope, equipment standards, building codes, building design, and establishing policies that prioritize efficiency as a primary part of U.S. domestic policy. And I'm having a problem here. Excuse me, I'm sorry. And I apologize. I'm having a problem with my technology. Oof. Do this way. <laughs> I do not. And that's probably why I'm having a problem. At the end of the day, efficiency needs to play an essential role in U.S. energy policy and should be seen as a necessary and critical to help address our challenges, including climate. Efficiency investments are more critical when considering avoided infrastructure costs, in addition to creating greater energy system reliability because of that reduced demand. Moreover, efficiency is one of the most cost-effective and fastest ways to reduce emissions. And as indicated in a recent report halfway there, efficiency alone can reduce carbon emissions by 50% by 2050. And according to the International Energy Agency, over 40% of the emission reduction objectives of the Paris Climate Agreement can be reached through efficiency by 2040. Further, if we're talking about economic impact, Energy efficiency is the largest employer in the clean energy economy. We employ over 2.1 million people in the United States, and energy efficiency jobs are located in all but six counties in this country. We are local. We do this locally. We pay, on average, $24 an hour, or 28% higher than a national medium. And so as you consider moving forward with budget reconciliation and tackling our challenges and future preparedness, we urge you to look at efficiency and make substantive investments. Investments, tax credits like 25C, 179D, 45L are important to get us moving over, moving forward, in addition to programs like Hope for Homes, Building Codes, and the like. We thank you for your leadership on these issues and, of course, are available for any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Glover. Mr. Johnson, you're recognized for five minutes to summarize your testimony. Welcome. Good morning, Chair Castor, Ranking Member Graves, and members of the House Select Committee. I'm honored to be invited to discuss the important role that buildings and the built environment can play in reducing America's contribution to the global crisis, uh, climate crisis. Again, thank you for inviting me for, to this discussion. My name is Darnell Johnson, and I serve as the CEO and president of Urban Efficiency Group, a utility implementation contractor and community uh, sustainability design firm. Our firm's work system, uh, systemizing sustainability has influenced how BIPOC communities adopt energy efficiency and sustainability best practices and how they engage in uh, cross-community uh, climate collaborations. As you may know, the building sector is responsible for 31% of the U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. And while buildings are significant contributors to our climate crisis, they can also be a key part to the solutions. As the committee is focused on addressing the climate crisis, I want to emphasize that all of my testimonies today and test all policies and practices that will advance energy efficiency will not only help save the planet by addressing climate change and deep uh, decarbonization, but will also have, save the people as our decisions affect the lives of real humans both environmentally and economically. Uh, therefore, we must ensure our actions toward eliminating uh, energy poverty are diverse, equitable, and inclusive. As we look at the stark disparities that exist in uh, U.S. energy burdens, both in urban and rural local in low-income uh, households spend substantially greater proportions of their income on energy costs when compared to non-low-income households. 
often technology, uh, op, I'm sorry, often those that fall between the gap of qualifying for low income energy efficiency programs um, and those that have the, the financial bandwidth to leverage rebates and pay the upfront costs associated with energy efficiency upgrades are left with limited options and, oft, and are oft, often referred to as the working poor. To bridge this growing gap, Congress should advance policies aimed at helping middle-income Americans make energy efficiency upgrades to their home. That's the reason why I strongly uh, urge Congress to enact the bipartisan Hope for Homes. And, and I want to thank Chairwoman Castor and Congressman Kasten on this committee for their co-sponsorship to that. This is important legislation that aims at uh, helping all Americans by providing home homeowners manager energy or savings for homes, rebates for upgrading homes and doubling the, those rebates for middle and lower income Americans. As we look at the economic benefits, the same uh, built environment that creates some of our challenges also creates the opportunities for small business and workforce development opportunities. Energy efficiency was the largest employer and the fastest growing sector in the energy industry before the pandemic and can be again but simply put, energy efficiency equals jobs. It's cru crucial that we invest in our workforce and then, and that means that we must ensure that contractors across the country have equal access to job training. Uh, the HOPE training uh, portion in HOPE for Homes that I mentioned earlier would provide immediate HOPE training support to contractor businesses and help companies pay their contractors to undertake training to educate them about a home's energy structure and systems. And as we begin to look at the, the equity within all of this, the challenges of energy equity are also visible in the disproportionate diverse makeup of the workforce and the contractors. And so we have to do more to prepare our diverse workforce for quality jobs and energy efficiency and drive further growth in this industry. In conclusion, uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, I again thank you for the opportunity to come before you and to share uh, in this important discussion one of the things that is really important is that the blue collar to green collar jobs development act of 2021 would create a comprehensive program to improve education and training for workers in the energy efficiency industry and so the legislation would also give priority to the businesses and other entities that recruit workers for local communities displaced energy sector workers veterans minorities and women thereby uh, creating more diverse robust and inclusive workforce for the future and so as I conclude, I ask that you consider the homes that you and your uh, constituents live in as a part of the solution to eliminate the crisis, the climate crisis. We can no longer allow incrementalism to be the standard by which we measure success when dealing with the complex issues of climate and energy efficiency. We acknowledge the challenges regarding the climate crisis are great, but our collective ability to find a resolve is greater. Achieving energy equity is the outcome of an intentional investment. Thank you, and I look forward to any questions that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Schreiber, you're up. Uh, welcome. You have, you're have you recognized for five minutes to summarize your testimony. Thank you. Good morning, Chairwoman Castor, Ranking Member Graves, and members of the committee. My name is Dave Schreiber, and I am the President and CEO of the American Public Gas Association. I am honored to appear today on behalf of the approximately 1,000 communities across the United States to own and operate their retail natural gas distribution systems. APGA's members are not-for-profit gas distribution systems owned by cities and other local government entities. The primary mission of a public gas system is delivering affordable energy. Our members have no obligation to deliver a profit to shareholders. Instead, local officials are responsible for setting rates with the goal of delivering energy to their community as safely and affordably as possible. That mission has become even more vital as Americans are struggling with the burden of high prices at the gas pump and rising inflation. Natural gas has not been immune to price increases in recent years, but data from the Energy Information Administration continues to show that it remains the most affordable fuel source to heat your home in the winter. Homes fueled by natural gas consume less energy than electric homes when you consider the full fuel cycle from source to site, because almost two thirds of the energy delivered involved in delivering electricity is used or lost before it ever reaches the point of end use. In contrast, less than 10% of natural gas is lost between the point of production and the residence, making direct use of natural gas almost three times more efficient than electricity. It is estimated that the average home that uses natural gas appliances for heating, cooking, and clothes drying saves over $1,000 a year 
compared to homes using electric appliances. Emissions reduction efforts also play a critical role in public gas systems' ability to deliver energy affordably. Leaks are not just bad for the environment, they are also bad for business. APGA members have dedicated significant resources to upgrading their pipeline infrastructure and investing in leak detec detection technology to decrease the amount of gas lost. Those efforts are good for the environment, but also ultimately reduce our members' operating costs and deliver savings to consumers. APGA's members are also committed to helping their customers reduce their energy usage. Most offer weatherization assistance and appliance rebate programs to help their customers reduce their demand for energy and lower their bills. Natural gas is not only more affordable than electricity, but also more reliable due to the inherently secure nature of the underground pipeline network that is used to deliver it, which is less vulnerable to extreme weather than electric transmission lines. Only one in 800 natural gas customers experiences an unplanned outage in a given year, compared to electric customers who experience an average of at least one outage every year. Even though we know natural gas is the most affordable and reliable way to fuel a home, public gas systems are still facing challenges. Some of our members have wait lists for would-be customers who cannot be connected due to a lack of pipeline capacity. This is a direct result of how difficult it has become to permit new natural gas infrastructure to supply gas to everyone who wants it. In colder climates, this often means continued reliance on propane or heating oil, which leads to higher energy bills and a greater environmental footprint. We are also, we are also facing proposed bans on new natural gas hookups or building code changes at the local level to disincentivize the use of gas appliances. These bans are being proposed even though residential natural, use, natural gas use accounts for only 4% of emissions in the United States. Not only does this take away a consumer's right to choose the energy source that fuels their home, these efforts will also lead to higher costs for American families while producing little environmental benefit. If, fuel switching on if politicians force fuel switching on natural gas customers, those households will not only face higher energy bills, but will also have to shoulder the cost of expensive new appliances. Last year, the Consumer Energy Alliance considered what it would cost if the nearly 60 million American households who rely on natural gas were forced to switch their furnaces, water heaters, stoves, and clothes dryers to run on electricity. Their research estimated a nationwide cost to consumers of more than $258 billion. Those costs are just for the appliances themselves and do not account for the electric service panel upgrades needed to support the additional load of converting all their appliances to run on electricity. One recent study estimated that could result in an additional $100 billion cost nationwide. APJ understands the need to transition to a clean energy future, but we urge Congress not to discount the role natural gas can play. Natural gas has been deli delivering emission reductions in the energy sector for decades, but the development of renewable natural gas and the potential of hydrogen, the gas industry can continue to deliver clean energy for American families in the future. Congress should pursue an all of the above energy policy that continues to invest in energy efficient gas fired appliances and the infrastructure needed to support their continued use if we are going to transition to a clean energy future without comp compromising reliability and imposing unnecessary burdens on consumers. I thank the committee for the opportunity to testify on this important topic and I look forward to today's discussion. Thank you. Next, Ms. Baldwin, welcome. You are recognized for five minutes to present your testimony. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Castor, Ranking Member Graves, and Select Committee members. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here this morning. I work for Energy Innovation, which is a nonpartisan energy and climate policy think tank. We provide research and analysis to support policy design that reduces emissions at speed and scale required for a stable climate. Our work is data-driven and uh, informed by climate science. The IPCC report released this week made clear that actions needed are needed within this decade and they will determine our collective climate future. Ignoring the urgent call to act will result in locked-in emissions, stranded assets, non-viable investments, and costly climate change. The same IPCC report, as well as a recent International Energy Agency report, points to widespread electrification of more end uses, buildings, vehicles, and some industries, as a way to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. Electrification refers to switching end uses that currently run on fossil fuels to run on carbon-free electricity, for example, by replacing an older inefficient gas furnace with a more energy efficient all electric heat pump. The high prices for oil and gas are front of mind right now, but it's important to keep in mind that they're the result of issues on both the supply side and the demand side. 
Reducing the demand for fossil fuels protects customers by putting a dampening effect on high and volatile prices. Electrification reduces demand for fossil fuels, and today's all-electric technologies are far more efficient than their fossil fuel counterparts. For example, air source heat pumps to heat your home are two to four times more energy efficient than natural gas burning furnaces. Induction stoves outperform gas stoves by three to one without emitting harmful indoor air pollution. And EVs are nearly four times as efficient compared to gas or diesel vehicles, also with pollution benefits to communities and individuals. Electric technologies are also cheaper to operate, and electricity is a more price-stable commodity, which insulates consumers from price shocks. A March 2022 analysis shows EVs are three to six times cheaper to drive per mile than gas-powered vehicles. Another analysis shows that if all new vehicle sales were all electric in 2035, that would yield $2.7 trillion in consumer savings by 2050. Electricity is generated from a diverse set of homegrown resources, and electric utilities and the grid are highly regulated to ensure affordable and reliable electricity for all end users. Modeling from energy innovation shows that electrification combined with a clean carbon-free grid is the most cost-effective pathway to drive down greenhouse gas emissions to net zero by 2050, while also creating jobs and improving public health. Our modeling shows that strong policies would, by 2050, increase gross domestic product by $920 billion, create more than 5 million new job years, avoid more than 45,000 premature deaths, and 1.3 million asthma attacks annually. We already have the technologies we need to start electrifying more end uses, and we don't have to wait for a breakthrough or an unproven costly alternative to be viable. However, ensuring a wide range of available models and products and a trained workforce to support widespread electrification in an equitable manner requires policy to remove barriers to uptake and enable mainstream ad adoption. Equi equitable incentives for EVs and electric appliances, such, such as those passed by the House last year, would be market game changers and ideally would be integrated into any future reconcil reconciliation package. Well-designed incentive provisions such as caps based on income and cost per vehicle, used EV incentives, and higher incentives for electric equipment in uh, households that are underserved and communities that are frontline will ensure more Americans can access and benefit from these technologies sooner. Although I've not touched on it in detail today, more, su excuse me, more support is needed for industrial electrification. The US industrial sector contributes nearly a quarter of our greenhouse gas emissions, yet few policies focus on this sector. Industrial operations are an untapped opportunity for greater price stability for made in America commodities by shifting more processes to run on carbon free electricity. Policies to boost domestic manufacturing and production of the minerals and materials needed for electric and clean technologies will improve America's competitiveness and make our economy more insulated from supply chain disruptions. The recent invocation of the Defense Production Act for critical minerals and some provisions in the Infrastructure Act are important first steps, but more incentives and funding would help move the dial. In conclusion, the urgency of our climate crisis combined with the inherent price volatility of oil and gas requires that we work quickly to electrify as many end uses as possible. Although 2050 may seem like a faraway day, policy adoption and implementation take time, as does the necessary capital stock turnover to convert existing fossil fuel assets to carbon-free assets. We must start now. Electrification is a viable solution that reduces harmful air pollution, creates American jobs, saves consumers money, and offers a cost-effective pathway to decarbonize our economy. But we need federal leadership and smart policies to electrify the movement. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to questions. Well, thank you to all of our witnesses for your insightful testimony. I'll recognize myself uh, for the first five minutes for questions. You know, it really has been a remarkable um, last decade to watch the American innovation in energy innovation in appliances and housing and, and materials, and it holds such promise to help our neighbors back home reduce their electric bills and save money, but also reduce pollution with all the health benefits that brings and help us solve the climate crisis. And that's why I'm really proud of the bipartisan infrastructure law uh, that President Biden championed that uh, has these historic investments in weatherization, which means you know the ability to add insulation into your homes, uh, more energy efficient appliances and smart meters and things like that. Uh, it means we're going to update our building codes, and we provided uh, historic resources for the elect electric vehicle charging, uh, and even down to helping public schools uh, become more energy efficient and save taxpayers money overall. Uh, but Ms. Baldwin, you know, 
you've taken a deep dive. Energy innovation certainly has done a, a really comprehensive analysis. There are a lot of naysayers out there that say, oh, okay, uh, we, can't, uh, we can't have a reliable grid. We can't have all of these things. We can't save money and uh, reduce pollution and help solve the climate crisis. What do you say after all of, all of your uh, work and analysis looking at the EE uh, opportunities? Thank you for that question, Chair Castor. Um, what I would say is that you know our model informs our work. We really try to identify the solutions that are most cost effective that simultaneously create uh, co-benefits. As I mentioned, creating a, cl a clean grid powered by carbon-free electricity and then electrifying as many end uses as possible shows uh, repeatedly that that is the way to drive down emissions. And we can do so by saving consumers money, but also uh, creating American jobs. Is it easy? No, we have work to do. I think that's clearly the message for this committee, as well as the committee, uh, excuse me, as well as this body. There are ample opportunities to correct market failures with strong policy and leadership. And I think that, as I mentioned in my testimony, the reconciliation package forthcoming that may or may not pass is a, is a great funny. opportunity to rectify these market failures, to, to fill in the gaps that the Infrastructure Act uh, did not address, and really address the, the American consumer and the businesses here and, and figuring out ways to benefit them. And Mr. Johnson, you're doing a lot of that hard work on the ground. I mean, this is labor intensive to help, help uh, folks on the ground, small business owners, uh, folks who are just trying to get through the day. Tell me what has been successful. And now with these historic uh, investments, uh, just under the bipartisan infrastructure law and hopefully with uh, some of the other tax credits, what's happening out there and what opportunities do you see and what else do you need uh, for the Congress to help, help uh, folks put the insulation in their homes, uh, weatherize their homes, get the, the energy efficient appliances in? Thanks for the question, uh, Chair Castor. And I think that you know it's very insightful that we began to look at what's going on at the ground, at the ground level. And as we began to look at different legislations such as uh, Hope for Homes and the Hope for Homes Act and the Zero Energy Home Act, all of these different types of bills that are being making resources readily available to empower the contractor at the ground, the boots well, on the tell ground. Tell us the story of the, uh, the contractor. What's Tell us a personal story of, sure. of what you've seen um, on the ground in in where you do work. Absolutely. And, and I think that, you know, most importantly, what's most transformative to me is when we began to see how these, these resources directly impact the contractor and their ability to scale their businesses and create local jobs and create opportunities for small business development and expansion of those small businesses. Um, as we begin to see the infusion of resources, we've been able to see small businesses empowered to deliver training for their existing staff to be able to scale up while being able to afford to bring on new employees to be able to expand their business model to deliver on the growing demand of energy efficiency and the other sustainability best practices that are out there. And so it's really important to see that happening because that's where the magic really happens. Oftentimes on the ground where we don't see those lives transformed, those businesses expanding, and those communities being re receiving services that they've traditionally been overlooked. Um, and so that's empowering for me when you, be when you understand the disproportionate nature by which historically those services have not been delivered. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Armstrong, good morning. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. I, it's just interesting to me how different different places in the world are, and even in our own country, as there's a lot of communities do, doing what they can, either uh, rightly or wrongly, to try and wean themselves off of gas. We're trying to get more uh, in North Dakota, and you know, we've we, over the last 10 years, our state has grown over about 16 percent, which for a small rural state is a lot. And the number one, but it doesn't tell the whole story. We've had tremendous growth in the western part of the state, tremendous growth growth in the eastern part of the state, but our rural egg communities in the center part of our state continues to have an out-migration. And the number one thing I hear from every one of those communities in order to survive in the 21st century, we need water and we need gas. 
and we need it for things that are important, not just for North Dakota, but I think for the whole country and the world right now. We're trying to get a fertilizer plant put together. We have a soybean crushing facility that will then take its products and put them into a biodiesel refinery, of which we sell almost all of it to the state of California. And listen, not all problems with this are born out of the federal government. I know I, I know it's easy to deal with this, but we've had a tremendous oil boom in Western North Dakota and have fought and fought and fought and invested billions and billions of dollars to get gas, gas infrastructure in place so we can actually deliver that associated gas that we are that we are capturing in the western part of the state to some of our communities. Uh, and we need it and we don't have the other options. But I think, I mean, there's not a member on this community that doesn't support energy efficiency. It's good for the consumer, it's good for the environment. And year over year producers throughout the system improve a variety of household items to increase efficiency and deliver energy savings to the market and at home consumers demand. Everything from windows to heating systems to small appliances, consumers demand these items deliver efficiency at an affordable price and the market provides. However, I do, I, and I do get concerned whenever we talk about and have these conversations in, uh, about energy efficiency because I, they, they often in this town tend away from cooperation and move towards mandates. And uh, voluntary programs that allow the market to innovate and the consumer decide, decide just work better because they work better in North Dakota compared to Colorado to compared to wherever else because the on the, on the ground demands are just uh, different depending on where you live. So, Mr. Shriver, the Energy Star program is a well-known guide for consumers looking to choose more energy efficient items for their home. Seeing the blue label on an application is a powerful indicator that guides consumers in a certain direction when purchasing at home appliances. In your testimony, you mentioned the cost savings provided by gas appliances. Are those included in the Energy Star program? Not to the extent that we would like. We believe that there should be a greater focus on the costs associated with operating the appliance. And as I mentioned earlier, there's tremendous savings associated with natural gas appliances. Um, the way that program is structured right now, natural gas appliances do not make that top cut of the most elite, most efficient under Energy Star. We, we, as I said earlier, we do believe that natural gas appliances are the most efficient on a site versus source basis. They're 92% efficient. You, you don't lose three, thir three times that efficiency that you do on electricity. So um, we would like to see the program revamped to include uh, natural gas appliances in that top tier. Well, and would it be fair to say through EPA actions, there's entire communities in states like mine that will not be able to take advantage of the program now because they don't have other options? We, we think um, studies have shown consumers prefer natural gas. They prefer it for cooking. They prefer it for heating. It's more efficient. It's more affordable. Um, you know, overall, it, it's domestically produced. Um, so from APJ's perspective, we're concerned about any federal action that precludes the ability of a consumer to choose which appliance works best for them. And uh, we've seen standards at the Department of Energy that we believe push people away from natural gas furnaces. Um, so that's something we're focused on. Ian, can you specifically walk through some of the costs associated with forced electrification and current efforts to increase the efficiency of gas appliances? Sure. If you have a forced electrification, you're going to have costs associated with switching your appliances out. You have costs associated with upgrading your electric panel. Uh, you're going to have costs associated with upgrading generation, transmission. All those costs can be passed on the consumers, and they're significant. But it's not just efforts to ban or discourage the use of appliances in the home. In your testimony, you mentioned efforts at the local level to cut off supply, including through bans and natural gas hookups. What policy proposals at the federal level may have a similar effect? We haven't seen anything at the federal level, just at the local level, as you stated. We have seen communities ban new natural gas hookups, which more or less creates a death spiral for that local gas utility. At the federal level, in the past, we've seen appliance standards that push people away from natural gas, such as the furnace standard that requires a condensing furnace. Thank you. I yield back. Uh, next up, Rep Brownlee. I see you virtually. Welcome. Uh, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and <clears throat> thank you for uh, holding this hearing. Um, I wanted to talk about a bill that I that I introduced a while ago. It's um, a bill around, you know, energy efficient appliances for both consumer products and uh, industrial equipment. And and the bill allows, you know, states to set 
uh, stricter standards than the national standard when the DOE uh, misses statutory deadlines for issuing uh, new or revised standards. It expands the pool of products that uh, DOE uh, may issue standards. It reduces the lead time for when standards must come into effect, generally to a maximum of three years. And it gives explicit authority to DOE that it can evaluate more than just one efficiency uh, metric standard, uh, efficiency, uh, uh, sorry. It, it can evaluate more than one efficiency metric when measuring products performances. So um, we know that you know, products not covered by the federal standard have the potential to save Americans a substantial amount of energy. And you know, there are so many um, you know, products, or there's so many, yeah, so many products that most states uh, that under the that are not under the federal law that states are providing they can provide their own efficiency standards if it's not covered by uh, federal law and there are quite a few and the states seem to be doing a better job in my opinion um, than the, than the federal government uh, does so um, Ms. Glover can you kind of speak to you know if we had better federal standards, higher standards, um, continuing standards that continue to up, update um, with new technologies, uh, et cetera. You know, what difference is that gonna make uh, for both uh, consumers and both for our climate? Congresswoman, I wanna first apologize because I'm not as familiar with your proposed bill. So I'm gonna tried my best to answer your question, but I'm not familiar with your bill and I want people to put that on the record. You know, I think improved standards can always help consumers, um, but I think we also want to ensure that we have the right standards in place so that consumers can make the choices that are best for them. Um, and I think in doing that and giving people the kind of information that they need to make those choices, we can resolve lots of problems. My hesitancy is always that we have many problems that we're trying to solve at the same time. We're trying to address climate, we're trying to um, address affordability, and we're trying to address um, security. And so we wanna make sure that creating a standard that solves one problem doesn't make another problem worse. And so that, that would be my only hesitancy. Um, I also though believe that consumers are really the ones who should have the say. And that as we talk about equity, um, we should be thinking and allowing communities to really speak on their own behalf for what they believe is right for themselves um, and how this transition should work for them. Um, because in the end, I think that's one, how we're gonna have some sustainable change that is going to be um, successful um, and not have a flip-flop because we're trying to enact some things that um, consumers aren't aligned with and do not support. So then do you, th do you think that it, it is better not to have federal standards and to have you know, community standards, state standards that are more consistent with what the consumer no, I don't want to say that. No. So let me correct myself. I'm absolutely not saying that we should not have federal standards. Okay. And do you believe that the federal standards are not comprehensive enough? I honestly, um, Congresswoman, do not know that I would have enough information to say that they aren't or they are. I just, I don't know enough. Okay. Uh, is there anybody else on the panel that might respond? I'd be happy to jump in, Congresswoman, uh, with one comment, which is uh, there's absolutely room for improvement with respect to appliance standards. We are um, lagging relative to the rest of the world, and in particular uh, with respect to all electric appliances. I think that there's much more that can be done to bring more of them into the market and, and make them uh, both more cost competitive up front, uh, but also get them get the models and the products into the into circulation. We we are not seeing enough in circulation. So, or should be done, and it could, and can be done. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I yield back. Uh, next, uh, Rep. Palmer, you recognize for five minutes. Thank the chairman. Thank the witnesses for being here. Um, 
Mr. Johnson, um, there's a township in Pennsylvania, Pembroke Township, about 2,100 people, 85% or so are African American. Uh, they've been heating their homes with wood, with propane, uh, uh, which is fairly expensive. Uh, they, they haven't had natural gas. Jesse Jackson, Al Sharpton, Mark Morial, uh, major civil rights leaders have all been involved in trying to get a natural gas pipeline into Pembroke Township. Uh, do you support their efforts to do that? I want to thank you for the question. I think that's very, a very good. Yes or no, just, I mean, do you support their efforts to get a natural gas pipeline so that these people can have low cost, or well, it's not as low cost as it used to be with the Biden administration policies, but uh, low cost, reliable uh, fuel for heating their homes in the wintertime? So yes or no? I, I think there's a bit more than yes or no. I mean, I, no, I, it's a yes or no. You either support or you don't. I, I think it's a bit more than yes or no. I think, and, and I think your answer is no, and I think you. No, I, I wouldn't say it is no. My answer, my answer is not no, but I, when you ask me if I support their efforts, when you say their efforts, I think that efforts are much broader than just saying whether I support it on the premises of them getting no, natural sir, gas. I, I'm not going to let you filibuster the answer. You either support getting these this impoverished community natural gas, which not only provides them with a means of heating their homes, but also gives them the opportunity to grow local economy and create jobs. And I, I don't understand why uh, those of you uh, on the other side of the aisle just cannot say yes or no to a simple question. It's because you don't support it. Mr. Shire, uh, I've talked a lot about uh, energy poverty, uh, energy injustice, economic injustice. I grew up dirt poor. We heated our house with a coal heater. We cooled it with a box fan and a window. Uh, so I kind of get this a little bit. And um, I just want to hear from you how what benefit it has been to um, American families, particularly low-income families, for the revolution in, in natural gas. Because, and I'll, I'll give you some stats and you can comment on it. Uh, over the last decade, it is uh, natural gas uh, uh, prices have saved consumers $1.1 trillion. Our electricity customers' uh, costs have gone down by $203 billion. And, and um, Ms. Baldwin might be interested in this. It saved 11,000 winter deaths. Would you like to comment on that? Thank you for the question. I agree with you. Um, homes powered by natural, fueled by natural gas save consumers money. And when you're talking about low income homes, um, that's especially important because that's less of their percentage that's going to pay their utility bill. Um, natural gas is fueling an industrial surge in states like Georgia. Um, it's, as I mentioned, it's cheaper than electricity. It's more reliable than electricity. Uh, it's domestic. It's abundant. It's resilient. Um, for all those reasons, we think um, consumers benefit from having natural gas appliances in their home. Well, at the very beginning of the Biden administration, they began terminating leases on, on federal lands. Uh, we know the other things they've done has caused prices to go up. We were below $3 per million cubic feet of natural gas. Now we're up around, what, 6 or $7? And uh, that's coming right straight out of the pockets of hardworking Americans that uh, right now are struggling to pay their energy bills, uh, struggling to pay their, their food bills. Uh, the U.S. Census Bureau reported that a fourth of all U.S. households uh, cut back on what they spent on food and medicine because of higher utility costs. Uh, in Great Britain, uh, Ms. Baldwin, you might be interested to know this, that in the winter of 2016, 2017, because of the tremendous increase in utility, household utility bills, there were 17,000 excess winter deaths directly attributed to energy poverty. I, I fear that's where we're heading in this country. And, and Mr. Shire, would you like to comment on that? Sure. From APJ's perspective, our members are fighting hard to preserve the ability of consumers to choose natural gas. As I said, you know, those who want to have natural gas in their homes should be allowed to have it, whether it's for cooking, water heating, um, a cooktop, a cooktop uh, heating their home. Um, we believe consumers want natural gas and should have that choice. For the record, let it uh, be known that the Republic, my Republican colleagues and I support lower household uh, energy costs for all Americans. I yield back. 
Uh, Brett Bonamici, you're recognized for five minutes. Good morning. Thank, thank you, Chair Castro, and thank you to all of our witnesses. We we all know that investing in energy efficiency lowers household and business energy costs, reduces emissions, and mitigates the effects of climate change, including on respiratory health. In my state, uh, we have Energy Trust of Oregon. It's an independent nonprofit organization that partners with our local utilities to help consumers, uh, their customers, benefit from energy efficient use and also renewable energy generation. In 2021, their efforts kept a total of 100, 162,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Uh, that's equivalent of moving, removing 38,000 cars from Oregon roads for a year. So <clears throat> they really do show that energy efficiency works. Um, Mr. Shriver, I want to thank you, first of all, for acknowledging the need to transition to clean energy. Thank you for that acknowledgement. But I note in your testimony, you talked about the cost of electrifying common household appliances, and you said it would cost more than $258 billion. <clears throat> I want to point out that that finding does not accurately depict the actual costs and benefits of electrifying household appliances. It, does, it only accounts for the upfront costs and not the lower energy use and long-term savings that, that come from electrification. And, and second, it ignores the reality that thousands of customers every year actually replace aging appliances. So it's sort of analogous to discussing the cost of transitioning to clean energy without considering the cost of inaction or the benefits of, of transitioning. And I wanted to ask Ms. Baldwin, I have a two-part question. Why do the long-term cost savings associated with household electrification outweigh the upfront costs? And second, how can we help appliance buying consumers? And this is following up on your, your uh, answer to, to Representative Brownlee. How can we help appliance buying customers make choices that will save them money and keep the air they breathe cleaner? Thank you so much for that question, Congresswoman. Um, as I stated in my testimony, energy efficient appliances and all electric appliances in particular hold an, an efficiency advantage over their fossil fuel counterparts, which means that for each unit that goes in to provide heat or heat water or to cook, you get two to four times more out of that unit of heat. And that is effectively why there are substantial energy savings over the long term. Uh, in addition, electricity, as I mentioned, is a price stable commodity. We have a diverse source of resources that we draw on to provide electricity. And that diversity effectively creates a hedge against spikes in prices, as well as volatility resulting from reliance on international markets. Oil and gas are, oil especially, but increasingly natural gas, are global commodities. And as such, they are subject to that volatility. To your second question, um, helping consumers get access to more efficient appliances and all electric appliances is paramount to success in this electrification effort. I know that in Utah, I cannot easily access a all electric heat pump without perhaps getting talked out of it by the contractors that I call who wanna sell me a, a gas furnace. I also know that I can't get an incentive from my utility because fuel switching is prohibited by law. I know that there are a lot of people out there who want to do the right thing, they want to uh, purchase an all efficient, an all electric uh, efficient heat pump, or an EV, or other appliances, and they find upfront cost to be the barrier. So policies that do two things: reduce the upfront cost, make it a level playing field, increase the uh, availability of those appliances in the market, sending right signals to manufacturers and contractors alike, and also ensuring that they have access to equitable financing. Excellent. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Johnson, thank you for your testimony. Uh, we, we know that, as you, you, you mentioned and Ms. Glover mentioned, uh, energy efficiency is also a boon for jobs. There were 2.1 million jobs in the energy efficiency space in 2020, more than any other sector within the energy industry. But job growth is potential and significant, but only 25% of the energy efficiency workforce is female, and black and Latino workers are underrepresented. So, Mr. Johnson, what steps can federal lawmakers take to increase diversity in the energy efficiency workforce? Thank you for that question. I, one of the things I think is very critical in terms of uh, increasing diversity is ensuring that there is access, local access, to training opportunities and making sure that those training opportunities are diversified so that there are more than one, there's more than one path to get you to a certification and get you into an industry that's growing at the rate that the energy efficiency industry is growing. I think that when we began to see more diversity within the ranks of workforce and small business development, you, we began to see broader adoption of those services and technologies in underrepresented communities as well. 
I appreciate that. And as a member of the Education and Labor Committee, we just marked up the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act the other day that's heading to the floor that, that will do just that to help people get into the path to a, a good job and, and also diversify and make those opportunities available to more. Uh, my, my time has expired. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. Thank you. Um, Mr. Carter, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank all of you for being here. This is a very important hearing, but I have to admit that it is somewhat ironic that here we have a hearing on how to promote energy security and cut energy bills at a time when we have a lack of energy security and we have record high energy prices directly as a result of the policy of this administration, of the Biden administration. That, that, that's just uh, some irony that I find here. Mr. Schreier, I'm, I'm very glad that we've got you here today. I appreciate you being here. You're with the American Public Gas Association. And, you know, gas is extremely important. It's a, it's a reliable energy to power our, it gives us reliable energy to power our economy. And, you know, and we, we really need natural gas well into the future. I, I want to share a story with you. I'm a member of the Conservative Climate Caucus. And about a month ago, we were over in Europe and in Brussels, and then we went up to Sweden, and we had an opportunity to meet with the leaders over there about what they're trying to do with renewables. The unfortunate thing that we found there is that the innovation is not keeping up with the public policy there. They have already set in place uh, the process of closing down nuclear plants, and some of them are already closed, and, and yet they can't provide for for their energy needs with with the renewables at this point. Now, hopefully they will in the future, and I hope we will here in this country in the future, but we can't right now. And we look at natural gas, and, and before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, what we saw was the you know Nord Stream 2, where they were going to be getting natural gas from Russia to Germany and, and all throughout Europe, and yet that's dirtier natural gas than what we have here in America. We have some of the cleanest natural gas, and we have an abundance of it. And I, I, I share another story with you, and that is that in my district, we've had an LNG plant that has converted from an import plant to an export plant at um, Elba Island. In, in Chatham County in Savannah, and, and that's the kind of that that's the kind of um, progress that we need to have, and that we need the direction that we need to be moving. And I'm I'm very convinced of that. Um, you know, I want to when we talk about when we talk about gas and natural gas, the direct use of natural gas in homes is 97 percent efficient, and and is almost universally cheaper than electricity. That, and that's significant again. And in Georgia, we've experienced that. I know in some areas of this country, such as uh, San Francisco, Seattle, New York, that they've, they've actually stopped using natural gas and prohibited it from using it. We've done just the opposite in Georgia. In fact, we've had, um, we've had the state of Georgia and our legislature actually prohibited local governments from banning natural gas or any other type of like of energy. And I, I think that's the right move and I'm very proud. And, and it's because of our use of natural gas in the state of Georgia that, that we've been able for, I believe it's seven years in a row now, been the most business friendly state in the nation. And, and it's, and it's because we have low energy costs. Because we utilize natural gas. Let me ask you, Mr. Schreier, as I just mentioned, gas is very important to the state of Georgia. How is the push for electrification impacting your members in my state? Thank you for the question. Uh, gas is very important in the state of Georgia. As I mentioned earlier, it's fueling an industrial growth that you just talked about, uh, which is great for the state. Uh, the Municipal Gas Authority of Georgia is one of our members, and they're very involved in that effort. Um, when you talk about electrification, one thing to keep in mind is uh, right now, natural gas is actually the largest source of electricity generation. It's 40 percent. Renewables are about 20 percent. And certainly renewables are going to grow and, and they should grow. But at the end of the day, when the wind's not blowing and the sun's not shining, that generation gonna be, is going to be backed up by natural gas generation. So our, our view is, isn't it a lot more efficient to use that natural gas directly? As we talked about, it's over 90% efficient from the time you take it out of the ground and get it to the burner chip. You're only losing 10% of that efficiency. With electricity, you're losing two-thirds of that efficiency when you take the natural gas out of the ground, get it to the generation plant, 
get it over the transmission line, the distribution line, and to the electric appliance. You're losing two thirds of that efficiency. Our view is it's just more efficient to use it directly. I, I'm almost out of time, Mr. Schreier, but I would be remiss if I did not mention, and, and it'll probably come as a surprise to my fellow members and my colleagues here on the committee, but Georgia being the number one forestry state in the country, not only do we use natural gas, but those forests serve as a carbon sink. So if you look at the full cycle, then you see that we are carbon neutral when we're using carbon, natural gas. And uh, with that new information that I have submitted to this committee, <laughs> I yield back. Rep. Naguz, you are up now. You're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Colorado's forests take great umbrage at uh, the championing of the Georgia forest, but my friend from, from Georgia. Uh, I will say, uh, Mr. Uh, Shriver, I hope I pronounced that right, uh, I appreciated your comment about renewables. I think you said renewables uh, will go up and should go up. And uh, I, I'm not sure if my colleagues on the other side of the aisle would agree with that sentiment, but I appreciate nonetheless you acknowledging that. I also will say that I am grateful that some of my colleagues uh, on the other side of the aisle have seen the light with respect to energy efficiency and the importance of promoting and advancing energy efficiency. I wish uh, they would have uh, translated that newfound uh, uh, passion for energy efficiency into legislative action because, of course, they've had multiple opportunities over the course of the last year and a half. Uh, to show in practice what energy efficiency means. Uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law, just by way of example, as, as I'm sure uh, each of our witnesses are, are aware of, uh, included significant investments in energy efficiency. Unfortunately, uh, I believe none of my colleagues, with the exception of one uh, of my colleagues on the other side of the dais, voted for that bill. But nonetheless, uh, we hope there will be more opportunities, as uh, one of our witnesses uh, mentioned, uh, through perhaps a reconciliation bill this summer, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see where the chips fall. Uh, I thought, uh, Mr. Johnson, your written testimony was very powerful. And as a quote here, I'll just read from it. A 2018 report from the ACEEE found that energy efficiency alone can cut energy use and greenhouse gas emissions in half by 2050. Just energy efficiency alone. That's remarkable. And I would think that could serve as a clarion call uh, for us to take energy efficiency seriously and to lean in and double down on the investments that would get us there. Now, uh, Mr. Shriver, I, I want to follow up on a, a question that my colleague uh, from Oregon uh, articulated during her, or during her presentation, and that was around some of the costs of uh, what you describe as forced electrification. Uh, and I, I guess I just want to dig in this a little bit. So you talk about, you say, the nationwide cost to consumers if we forced natural gas households to switch to electric appliances would come in at more than $258 billion in your written testimony. You're, you're saying if every, all 60 million Americans uh, that have natural gas appliances, dryers, furnaces, water heaters, et cetera, if they were all compelled to switch to electric devices today, that is the cost in your view. But of course, as you well know, the lifespan of a dryer is you know, 10, 15 years, right? Furnace, uh, you tell me, 15, 20 years, maybe with right repairs, maybe you go to 25. So th these, these appliances are being replaced every day in America. Uh, and this cost, I don't think is a, a true reflection uh, in that sense. I mean, you, you'd agree. We, we think the cost of, electric, of a forced electrification are significant. Uh, appliances will be switched. The transmission system will still have to be upgraded. Generation will have to be increased. And uh, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, the whole premise behind forced electrification is to move to a more renewable grid. But yet, at the end of the day, again, when the wind's not blowing, the sun's not shining, that generation sure, is going be backed I, up. I hear that gas. you say they're significant. I'm just saying that this number, I think you and I both can agree, nobody is saying that tomorrow every single appliance in the United States of America would be replaced. So I don't think this is a fair characterization of the cost. I hear what you're saying about your argument regarding the costs being significant. And so, you know, over a 10 year period or a 15 year period, uh, you know, perhaps you could talk about sort of uh, how much it would cost over that time uh, frame. But in any event, I mean, let's say we'll, we'll go with your number. Let's say $250 billion over a 10 year period, right? Um, do you know how much the tax code subsidizes crude oil and natural gas today? I think all, most energy forms enjoy subsidies of some form or another. Sure, I'm asking you about natural gas subsidies. 
Most of the natural gas, well, on the production side, you know, our members aren't producers. Understood. So I, I can't speak to those. Understood. I, I, you know, but it's part of the supply chain. I'm sure you. I'm sure you know that by some estimates, conservative estimates, they range between 18 billion dollars to 20 billion dollars a year. 80 percent of which uh, would go towards uh, natural gas and, and crude oil. You could, you know, further allocate that number, but you know, call it 10 billion, call it 11 billion dollars a year over the course of 100 years, or excuse me, 10 years, $100 billion that we are spending to subsidize natural gas here in the United States. Um, you know, I, I think that is an important part of the equation when you consider the upfront costs that you've described uh, regarding the electrification of appliances uh, in the United States. And, and I think that's important to keep in mind. But with that, I see my time has expired. I would yield back to the chair. Thank you. Uh, next up, Ranking Member Graves, you're recognized for five minutes. All right. Thank you. I uh, appreciate y'all's testimony. Um, Ms. Glover, I, I, uh, I really appreciated your, your comments. I just thought that they were uh, largely grounded and rational in, in thinking about uh, solutions. Uh, one of the things I mentioned in my opening statement that I just, I struggle with, and, and you know, looking at Vladimir Putin, for example, again, well, it, the guy has no respect for human rights. He doesn't care about the environment. He doesn't, he doesn't care about anything. Uh, all he cares about is his own ego. The United States has led the world in reducing emissions. And yes, energy efficiency efforts that you promote, it, it's, a, it's a part of that. It's a part of reducing emissions. How, how does the United States move forward with some of these actors like Russia and China and others who just don't care? I mean, and, and like I said before, for every one ton of emissions we've reduced, China's increased by four. And, and so how, how do we handle the sort of the international aspect? Because we can't change the climate just in the United States. It, you know, whatever happens is going to happen globally. And so what, what is your thought on how we address this international issue when you have countries like that that just don't care? That's likely the million dollar question, Congressman. Or gazillion. Um, okay, the gazillion dollar <laughs> question. Um, I, I don't know um, how you would change someone's mind. But I think that the United States can demonstrate some real leadership sure. in efficiency, right? By, by doubling down and making the kind of commitment so that every community, every small business owner um, has not only access to efficiency measures, but also is, has the ability to adopt them. Um, and that ability to adopt them, I think, is even more important in some way, right? That ties to this idea of affordability. Um, and through that demonstration of that leadership, what you would hope is that other economies would follow suit. Um, and I, I think and that may be the best that we can do. But in terms of your specific question of how do we influence of Vladimir Putin, how do we um, influence a Xi Jinping, I don't know. I mean, that, that would be my honest answer. Um, but I don't think that that should prevent us from doing what we can do in terms of efficiency here. And, and one of the things that I like, I, I think largely about your testimony, I'm not trying to put any words in your mouth, but I, but I think that you largely kind of reflect this model of aligning incentives. And what I mean by that is that, look, it's an incentive if I'm a, if I just own a house, it's an incentive for me to be more energy efficient because I have a lower heating and cooling bill, right? A lower electricity bill. Yes. A incentives are aligned and, and it makes sense there. But in, but in many cases, we're watching things that are being done where we're just spending unbelievable amounts of money and we're not seeing a requisite return on investment. We're, we're not see, we're, 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 we're spending money on things that's not providing return on investment for, for US, US taxpayers. And it's, it's concerning for me, but I, I just wanna tell you that I appreciate your testimony and your perspective on this. Uh, Mr. Johnson, um, you seem to express a, a lot of comments and concern about affordability, which again, you know, we, we represent South Louisiana. We have some of the highest poverty rates in America, and, and this is a big deal for our constituents. But you also seem to advocate a lot of policies that have been uh, uh, pushed by states like California, by European nations, where you have significantly higher energy costs there than we do in my home state. And, and so I, I'm... I'm just curious if you can help me reconcile that. So if you're pushing things that actually cause higher electricity bills and, and pushes people into energy poverty, uh, how does that line up with your objective of ensuring the affordability of energy? It's a good question. I think that one of the things that we have to be very clear on in 
understanding this, this larger issue of equity and energy efficiency and affordability is that there are different needs based upon the areas that you're in. And, and ultimately, when you're trying to address the needs of communities that have been traditionally left behind, it's going to require investments larger up front to get many of those communities on pace. So initially, yes, you will see um, a larger investment, but what we have to also focus on is what is the economy of scale over time? Mm -hmm. What is the payback on that investment? And so if we're looking at it strictly from an uh, upfront cost, then yes, we, it's very easy to make that to make that argument. But what is our rate of return on the backside? Are we making sure that communities are advancing? Are we making sure that uh, employment rates are uh, increasing? Are we making sure that workforce development opportunities are you know are being coming more diversified? There, those to be able to to lift those things, it costs. Thank you. I'm, I'm running out of time here, but uh, but but Mr. Shriver, I just want to make note uh, in up in. Uh, New England, we watched where they prohibited the connection of natural gas pipelines into homes and others, and uh, uh, we saw them have to get natural gas from Vladimir Putin to bring into New England to actually supply those homes. And I'm, I'm out of time, but I, I, I'll perhaps wait, submit a question for the record for you to uh, uh, share a little bit more information on that. Yield back. Hey, Rep. Kasten, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you so much for our speakers. I I am uh, I have a deep and long-standing love affair. Can you pull with your the, microphone closer? I'm sorry. That, that better. Um, I I have a deep and long-standing love affair with energy efficiency, and I appreciate you all being here to support it. Um, the uh, I think by most measures it is the single largest source of new energy um, in our system over the the last couple decades, and certainly the biggest opportunity going forward. I also think that it is. There's been some confusion in this hearing. This is the Climate Committee. Sometimes I feel like we need to remind ourselves of that. And energy efficiency per se is not the jurisdiction of this committee. It's the question of are we reducing the greenhouse gas emissions per unit of useful energy in our homes. Um, Mr. Palmer and I are in violent agreement. I do not want to go back to the coal burner in his house. Um, not because it was, even if it was a really efficient coal burner, I wouldn't want that in your home for all the pollution reasons. Um, and, and we're supportive of that transition. However, by the same logic, if you have a solar panel on your roof that's only converting sunlight into electricity at 9% and you're using that to keep your stove heated, I would rather you have that than a 33% electric grid converting natural gas because it is fewer greenhouse gas emissions and it's less money for consumers. Um, Mr. Johnson, um, number one, welcome from Chicago and representing us well. It's great to see you here. Um, you have been, a, I think, a very effective and loud advocate to make sure that all of our communities have access to cheaper and cleaner energy. And as I'm sure you're aware, it's fairly common practice for a lot of municipal utilities who in theory should support a locality's freedom to choose to actually prevent you from having access to all those choices. There's 21 states, I believe, that have, has legislation now in place that prevents municipalities from putting any limitations on, on the use of fossil, fossil gas in new construction. So. I, I think you'll agree, but just for the record, do you agree that it should be up to local communities to decide what's best for the people they represent? Absolutely. I think that there should be, uh, in looking at through the lenses of procedural justice, I think that we should be able to have a voice and be influential of what we're doing at the local level that best, best services that local community. Okay. Well, thank you. I'm glad you agree. Um, Mr. Shriver, a couple just quick yes or no's. Um, do I understand right, APGA is funded primarily by the membership dues from municipalities? By community-owned utilities. They're, they're not just cities, but... No, I understand, but, but yeah. most of your revenue comes from the, the funding from municipalities and your memberships in, in municipalities. That's correct. Yes, okay. So, so then most of your members are overseen or managed by a, a democratically elected municipal government, yes or no? The, the vast majority are regulated by a locally elected or appointed uh, utility board or city council. Okay, so so your industry has referred to your, your opposition to greenhouse gas emissions reduction as energy choice legislation, but doesn't that legislation prevent democratically elected municipal officials from actually setting the kinds of local energy policy and code <laughs> ordinances for their community that Mr. Johnson would like to see to make his job better? You're talking about the 20 states that have enacted energy choice legislation? I'm talking about the, the, the policies that you have been advocating for to prevent municipalities, democratically elected municipalities, from doing their jobs. Sure. I, and just for the record... Okay, thank you for the thank you for the yes, because I would like to submit... No, I, I, actually, it's not a yes. Uh, we believe 
natural gas is the best interest of consumers and they should have the right to choose natural gas, solar. These bills don't restrict just natural gas. They leave open any fuel okay. choice. Well, look, I, I, I want to come back to that. Madam Chair, I'd like to submit for the record an APGA board book that is listing energy choice legislation, as they call it, which serves as a gas preemption as their number one policy for 2021. Is, um, I, I want to come back to your last your last comment there, Mr. Shriver. I completely agree with your point that in a grid that is 33% efficient and is fueled by gas, the choice between using gas in a 33% efficient generator and sending that through a wire uses less gas, emits less greenhouse gas emissions than using that same gas to, you know, if, if it's a swap between an electric stove and a gas stove, I take your point. We are rapidly electrifying our grid. Oh, I'm sorry, we're actually greening up our grid. We cannot look our children in the eye and say that we are doing what we have to do to provide a sustainable planet unless we electrify massive parts of our grid and decarbonize the grid. In big parts of our country, like the Northwest, we are already primarily a renewable grid. Does your industry advocate in the name of our children, in the name of our environment, in the name of people's wallets, in those parts of the country that have a lower carbon grid, to make sure that people have access to those, or is it just about selling the gas? First of all, on the natural gas side, since 1990, we've reduced emissions by approximately 70%. I'm, I'm asking a different question. In, in a grid that does not have, that does not depend on 33% efficient fossil fuel plants, and yes, that is the grid we've had since 1957, it's not the grid we want to give our children. We, deserve, we owe them better. As we transition, is it still about the gas, or is it about giving ourselves Gentlemen, a better plan? time has expired. Go back. It's about the, I'm sorry. See. Next up, uh, Rep. Crenshaw, I see you virtually. Uh, you are recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I would say what we owe our children is prosperity and energy reliability. And um, as of now, there are only three things that offer that, gas, coal, and nuclear energy. I yield the remainder of my time to the representative from Louisiana, Garrett Graves. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Crenshaw. Um, Mr. Shriver, I, I want to continue the line of questioning before. So, so, so you have a situation where you have people, and, and, and Ms. Glover brought this up before, giving consumers choice. But you have governments that are coming in and actually blocking or preventing access to your, your technology, your ga gas in some cases. So when they didn't have the access to gas, they brought in home heating oil, which of course has higher emissions, less efficient, and, and, and more expensive. And then they had to bring in gas from Vladimir Putin from Russia. Uh, could, could you just reflect on the impacts to consumers whenever, and, and the, the environment and what it does to global security when you have policies like that that are so short-sighted? When you have a capacity constrained area like we've seen in Massachusetts and consumers want natural gas because it's cleaner, it's more affordable, it's more resilient, and they can't get it, they're heating their homes because, as you know, Massachusetts is a tough winter with heating oil or, or a propane, both which have a, a much more expensive and have a greater environmental footprint than natural gas. So, Madam Chair, I'd like to ask unanimous consent, uh, um, April 5th article from e, e News, surging electric bills threaten California climate goals. Uh, without objection. Thank you. Um, uh, another question, <clears throat> excuse me. Under the Biden administration, they projected that global energy demand is going to go up 50%, 50% between now and 2050. And, and that means... Yes, more renewables, and it means an increase in, in every energy source, wind and solar and wave and geothermal and oil and gas. Let me say this again. The Biden administration's projections show an increase in demand for all energy sources. In fact, for developing countries, depending on economic scenario, as much as an 80% increase in natural gas demand. So, so the Biden administration... The, the first or one of the first actions they took was an executive order to ban new energy production, to ban new energy production. So, so you're not cutting off demand, you're just cutting off domestic supply. So, so what, what happens in a scenario like that? And I know you're not an expert on the upstream side, but what happens in a scenario like that? And, you know, we've experienced it uh, last year at Storm Uri when you have instances where demand increases and supply decreases, consumers 
are hit with high energy prices. So, so consumers are hit with higher prices because, because you have a lack of, of supply to meet demand. But then also you have a scenario where other countries like, I don't know, Vladimir Putin comes in and backfills the lack of production in the United States. It was said a, a few times today, the U.S. has some of the most efficient, some of the cleanest production in the world. If, if the Biden administration is even projecting that there's going to be a 50 percent global increase in, 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 in energy demand, why would we not fill it domestically where we do it safer, we do it cleaner, it creates economic activity here, it doesn't fund bloodshed like we're seeing in Ukraine right now? Does, does that make sense to any of you? To, uh, to any of you, does that make sense? And why we wouldn't produce energy here when, when even this administration's saying there's an increase in demand? And, and by not doing it, as Mr. Shriver said, it results in higher prices. It results in funding authoritarian regimes. Like, look, I, I am all for energy efficiency. I am. I, because, it, because, like I said, Ms. Ms. Glover, the, the incentives are aligned. If we can pay lower electricity bills and it costs us less money to build widgets in the United States, that's great. It's good for all of us. But if, if we're just going to push solar and wind and whatever other pixie dust technology, and we haven't thought through the supply chain, and we're going to trade buying energy from Vladimir Putin to saying we're going to get critical uh, minerals and rare earths from China, who, who then is going to use the money against this as well, we've got to think through the supply chain change strategies here to, to, to make sure that we can actually achieve these goals in a way that's consistent with U.S. interests. Does that make sense? Do any of you object to, to, to domestic energy production, to meeting the demand? Madam Chair, just let the record reflect, no one objects apparently. Yield back. Well, I want to thank all of our witnesses for being very efficient today with their times. Uh, with their time, you've given us a lot of good advice on how to lower energy bills for consumers uh, at home. And re I, we hear you loud and clear, reducing, uh, using energy efficiency and all of these innovative tools also helps reduce greenhouse gases that are creating escalating costs for consumers. And that's the reality we face. And in fact, the world's top scientist, again, if you haven't dug into their report released just on Monday, uh, say that we must, must find these clean energy solutions quickly and urgently. We cannot continue to double down on costly fossil fuels. Uh, we need to stand up to the petro despots across the globe and break this addiction to fossil fuels. And the best way to do that, the most efficient way to do that, is through energy efficiency. The energy of uh, the jobs that are created right here in America that are abundant and ready to be deployed. Not just lip service to energy efficiency, but actual votes, policy, and resources provided to our neighbors back home. So with that, thank you all very much. The committee is adjourned.